Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I have started the next book in the Outlander series, Drums of Autumn, loving it so far. Um, today's video is the top 10 moments from the first half of the book. So I'm really excited to dive into those with you. Okay, so like I said, I am just a little over halfway, so I decided to film this video now. Um, and I have the top 10 moments from the first half of the book. So bear with me while we get started. These are not in any particular order, although I did try to kind of place them in order that they occur in the book, but it wasn't always possible. I'll explain why as we go. Okay, so number one, the ghost. If you are an Outlander fan like me, uh, I'm a book fan and a show fan. The ghost is probably the hottest topic, other than Frank, um, on the groups. People feel very strongly about it. Um, the ghost, I don't think, does not appear in this book. Of course, I'm talking about Jamie's ghost. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Jamie's ghost. Um, he doesn't appear in this book, but I think we do get some really exciting clues and hints about Jamie's ghost. Diana Gabaldon has not revealed everything there is to reveal about this topic, um, but she has said that obviously if you read the book carefully, you'll glean a lot of information. So I think that two important things have happened so far in Drums of Autumn. Um, I'm just around page 400 and, or 545 or so, um, if that helps you. So first off, Jamie and Stephen Bonnet have a conversation um, in the middle of the night when Jamie agrees to help him escape, um, you know, kind of against his better judgment. They're in the woods, they're riding in the wagon. Uh, Claire and Ian are like asleep in the back and Jamie and Stephen Bonnet get to kind of talking. And they have this conversation where Jamie is a Highlander. He has all these kind of superstitions um, and kind of like rituals. And Stephen Bonnet is Irish and has kind of the same thing. Not 100% the same, but it's a very similar characteristic about these two men. And they start talking about how Stephen Bonnet was supposed to be hanged and he made a last minute break for freedom and was successful. Jamie could have turned him in Maybe should have turned him in, but didn't because Jamie has been in that same boat. Jamie has been, you know, the morning before he's supposed to hang or be executed and kind of lived through that night and somehow just escaped by, you know, fate or circumstances or whatever. So they have this kind of kinship and they start talking about how, you know, some people like them who have had to kind of face the fact that I'm going to be dead tomorrow. Like this is my last night on earth you know, um, that they live half in the spirit world and half in the real world. They're not the same as they were before this experience. Um, that conversation really struck me when I was reading it. And I think it really alludes to that ghost of like, Jamie is here, but there's a part of him that is already or is always kind of a spirit or kind of erythral or kind of magical somehow. Um, and I think it relates to, as well, his, his visions. He's able to see into the future. Like he's able to see Brianna's birthmark that he would have no idea is there, but he asks Claire about it. He saw it in a dream and she goes, yeah, she really does have that birthmark. How would he know that? Um, the other thing about the ghost is, um, I have to edit that out. <laughs> Okay, the second piece of evidence, I guess, about this ghost is Roger's discovery about the night of Senane. I'm probably saying it totally wrong. Um, it's Halloween night or the night before Halloween, somewhere in there. And I think he discovers this in Galus's notes all about time traveling and the days that you can time travel where it's easier to do it. Your chances of being successful are greater. And there are all these fire feasts, you know, sun feasts, big holidays. Um, and Halloween is one of them. And he reads a note saying about how um, on Halloween or the night of All Hallows, um, the heroes rise from their graves and, and walk around and they're kind of with us in the real world. 
And that really spoke to me about Jamie's ghost as well, because of course, the incident with his ghost is he's looking up at Claire as she's in Inverness. Um, and Frank sees him and thinks, who's this man like staring at my wife in her hotel room? Like, that's not cool. Uh, goes to confront the man and the man vanishes, like disappears. Um, and Frank kind of accuses Claire of, you know, having had a, an affair or a liaison with someone that she was a nurse to, and maybe he's trying to look her up. And Claire has no idea what he's talking about, totally denies it. But that's Jamie's ghost. Diana has confirmed that it's Jamie's ghost. It's not just kind of a random apparition that Frank imagines or something. And so I think that this, you know, he rises from his grave and he sees her. And what part does that have to play on the rest of the story? So that was, okay, that was moment one. Jamie's ghost and all this stuff about it. Really, really interesting to me. Anyway. Um, okay. Okay. Moment number two of my top 10 moments from the first half. Um, Stephen Bonnet is a big character in this book and the coming books. Um, we meet him, terrifying, and he's not terrifying at first, um, but his attack of Jamie, Claire, Ian, and the boat that they're traveling on was terrifying to read. I remember the first time that I read it, I thought that either Rolo the dog or Ian might die. I really thought that they might die. Or someone, you know, one of the people on the boat, one of the captains or one of the um, um, drivers or whatever they're called. Um, I didn't think Claire or Jamie would die because there's still quite a lot of book left when that happens. Um, but absolutely terrifying attack. And it seems like Stephen Bonnet, this attack, I mean, it's so wonderfully written. It is so like bone chilling. Um, you really think he might rape Claire. He steals her wedding ring. He tries to get both. He's unsuccessful. Um, he takes everything that they have and he kind of says like, you're lucky I let you live. Like, you know, you like, yeah. Anyway, it, the, the reading, the actual scene, very impactful. And then of course, this event is key to everything else that happens in the story. Without this attack from Stephen Bonnet, um, would the later events transpire as they do? No, absolutely not, right? They meet Jocasta, but they have nothing because he stole all the, all the gems that they had kind of secretly hidden away. Um, the, the incident with Brianna and later in the book and later in the other books, like it's so, it's such a huge moment. And I mean, it really spells out like just, it makes him a larger in life figure to me. Whereas when we first meet him, when he's escaped hanging, he's kind of charming, he's putting it on, right? He needs their help and they do agree to help him. Um, and Jamie lives to regret that action. And so what impact does this whole thing have on his character? Is he a less forgiving man now? Is he less um, compassionate? I don't know. I, I want to think about that more. I forgot how horrible this attack was. Um, so yeah, it's just a very, it's just a very, very important event. Um, and it really does show Stephen Bonnet's character. And you see kind of at the start, Stephen Bonnet is really trying to show Jamie that they're alike, right? Um, they only meet because Jamie's friend Gavin Hayes was executed before Stephen Bonnet was. And so Bonnet kind of uses that to get on Jamie's good side, you know, like your, your friend was executed. He was a friend of mine too. We became friends when we were, you know, in jail together. Um, and kind of is trying to point out how they're similar type of men, right? They don't have much. They live by the seat of their pants. They're self-reliant. They have to, you know, kind of look out for themselves, look out for their families and the people responsible for them. But then with this event, we really see like, no, they're not cut from the same cloth. Um, and Jamie questions that later on in the book. He questions, you know, am I any better than him? And Claire really comes through and says, yes, like you are a hundred percent. 
Um, and so they talk it out. But anyway, moment number two was that attack from Stephen Bonnet um, and that what a big impact it has on the story. Okay, top moment number three is meeting Jocasta, Cameron McKenzie, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, so she is Jamie's aunt. He has never met her, but they exchange letters and she moved to America like 20 years before, right after Culloden. She and her husband managed to escape um, and get to America. She reminds me so much of Colum. Um, who we met in book one and a little bit later on. Um, we've met him as well. So she is blind, kind of similar to Colum. He has um, a degenerative disease with his legs where it's hard for him to walk. He certainly like can't move around easily. Um, she's also the head of her household because her husband has passed away, but she's blind. So she really needs a lot of help in getting things done and as we've seen in this book um people are like out to get you like you have to take care of yourself because the Stephen Bonnets of the world or the shady business people in that world um really will will take you for a ride so she has Ulysses her black butler um but he is not enough because he's a slave and he can kind of advise her and help her, but she sees Jamie coming and is plotting and, you know, trying to arrange it so that he will have to take care of her estate and her property. And it sounds like a good deal, right? Like she's very wealthy. She has this huge property. Jamie could kind of be the boss of it. He would do a great job. And that all sounds really good, but of course she would be there. She would be telling him what to do. And he and Claire would have to essentially own slaves at this plantation. That's how the plantation runs. And Claire even asks him, well, can we free them? You know, like, it, like, could we, we could do it, but free the slaves. And then, you know, we'd, morally we'd feel okay about it. And Jamie looked into it at that time in North Carolina, you weren't allowed to free your slaves. And if you did try to, you had to get the government's permission and you would only be granted to like one or two if they had like saved your life or like done something extraordinary. And then they would have to leave the state within like days or else someone else would just capture them and enslave them again. So it's just a horrible situation there. Um, and neither Jamie nor Claire can you know, convince themselves that it's just to participate in slavery. Um, and so they're kind of, well, Jamie is the one who figures out Jocasta's plan early on, and he's kind of trying to avoid it. And it really, really reminded me that she is the sister of Colum and Dougal, who were always plotting and planning and setting up situations to best, you know, advance their own agendas. She has her own agenda for sure. She also keeps her own secrets. So she's very kind and welcoming, but she has some secrets. So big moment to meet her, loved meeting her. Very interesting, um, interesting character to watch for sure. Uh, okay, so moment number four from this book, my top four moment um, was just how adventurous and exciting this book is. So. After they leave River Run, Jocasta's estate, they're not gonna manage it. They're not gonna, you know, they don't fall into her trap, thankfully. Um, Jamie and Claire decide to move to the back country of North Carolina. There are hardly any people there. Um, they get like 100 acres or something from the governor, but they have to settle it. They have to find people to move there who wanna like live in the middle of nowhere with them. And the first six months, they're kind of there on their own through the winter. So it was just a really cool part to read. Um, there's a couple things that happened really specifically that I loved. I loved 
the kind of juxtaposition that Claire shows of like, it is so romantic to just, you know, like an isolated cabin in the woods, the fire burning, you and your hubby, like, right? That's great. And then, you know, your nephew, your, your 16, 17 year old nephew comes back and it's all three of you in this stuffy little cabin. Um, not so romantic. <laughs> So I thought that was really funny. Um, oh, and his ginormous dog, who's half wolf. Like it's, and it's just disgusting in this cabin. Like there's a scene where she just is, it's in the morning and she's just going air, air, I need air. And she's like stumbling out of the cabin because it's just so hot and stuffy, right? Um, the other moment that I really, really enjoyed was the bear attack. So Jamie and Claire, it's like their first night out there. They're sleeping in the woods. It's the summer so it's still like fine to sleep or whatever and she feels Jamie like touch her like touch her back uh and then she looks across the fire and he's across the fire so was it him and she goes Jamie is there someone behind me and he like it's a bear so she goes flying the bear attacks Jamie Jamie's going after the bear he has a knife she hits the bear and Jamie in the face with one of the fish from their dinner. It's a huge disaster. Jamie somehow kills the bear. Um, these First Nations people come upon them and they're very impressed that Jamie killed the bear and they have to stay up all night with these guys, kind of talk, trying to talk to them, trying to communicate with them, trading goods. Um, just a really cool, really cool part of the book. I really enjoyed that. And then, uh, oh, my third favorite one, was they're all trying to sleep and um, Jamie and Ian have finally built like kind of a cabin for them to sleep in. And um, they wake up in the middle of the night cause there's a drip from the ceiling. And uh, so it's their homemade shingles, you know, one has just kind of come loose or there's a hole in one or something. And Jamie just, you know, Claire says, oh, just, just leave it till the morning. We just won't sleep in that spot. And then we'll just move over. And he goes, no, nope, I'm not having this. And he storms out there butt naked climbing on the roof in the middle of the night naked and hammering it shut and fixing it up. Like you just can't, can't handle that. It's not done properly. Um, and just the description is really, really funny. So yeah, I love how adventurous and exciting that part of the book specifically, but really the whole book is. Um, so that's great. Okay. Top moment number five, I'm only going to talk about this briefly is the Brianna and Roger love story. That's kind of developing back in 1969 um all in Scotland I think they're I think all the scenes are in Scotland although Brie is sometimes in the Amer in America um, but they're on the phone and exchanging letters so yeah it's interesting to read um she comes and spends Christmas her first Christmas kind of alone since her mom went back you know through the stones um in Inverness with Roger and it does seem really romantic you know like they go to mass they're kind of seeing each other's different Christmas traditions and how, you know, potentially their family together would kind of be. She's Catholic, he's Presbyterian. I don't know much about that, but it seems to be a kind of a big deal. Um, so he goes to, you know, Christmas mass with her and is kind of looking at like, oh, what are the things that they do differently and um, whatever. So I liked that part. Other than that trip though, and only parts of that trip, it doesn't really seem like they're connecting and um, their communication is off. They, they don't have sex during this trip. That seems to be a really big deal for Roger. Um, I think we also only see it from Roger's side, how into Brianna he is and how he feels about the situation. We don't hear from Brie. Like we don't hear in her own head, we just hear her talking to Roger. Um, he proposes, I thought the proposal was a little bit out of the blue. I have to be honest. Um, I don't know. It was the, it was a different time then. I don't know how you propose to someone and you're not sure what they're going to say. I think if you propose to someone, you're better be pretty sure they're going to say yes. Um, of course she says no and they kind of have a big fight and then she kind of explains and he says he understands, but I don't really think he does. Anyway, their love story is definitely a big part of the book. I think it'll be a bigger part of the book in the second half. Um, so I'm interested to keep reading about them. But yeah, they definitely 
have some connections and have some missed connections in this first half. Okay, moving right along. Reason or top 10 moment number six. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Moment number six of my top 10. Um, Jamie. It's all about Jamie and his kind of journey. So he is almost like depressed, I think, a little bit during part of this book. He feels real, I think, anger and regret with himself over the Stephen Bonnet situation. He saved this man thinking he was doing a favor in the name of a friend and, you know, that it would work out. And of course, it just does not. And he just feels so much anger and regret over that incident. I mean, he put his life at stake. He put his family, his wife, his nephew, who's been entrusted to his care, like a foster son, um, everything at stake. And luckily they escaped with their lives, but it could have been much worse. So he feels really dissatisfied with himself. He questions with Claire, you know, am I, am I a good man? What kind of man am I? I'm 45 years old. I drag my wife through the woods into danger. Um, you know, I, I have no home to give you like all these things. Um, and so I, I really loved the discussion that they have they almost have kind of a fight about it. Um, but you know, she kind of says, well, you have me and I'll go with you anywhere. Um, so yeah, I, that was my top six moment was that kind of discussion and how Jamie's kind of feeling and how it pushes him, I think, to take a big risk, to start this kind of homestead that becomes Fraser's Ridge and, um, you know, start building himself a new life, which I really admire, you know, this is the one of many times that he has reinvented himself and started from scratch. Um, so yeah, that was a really cool moment, number six. Number seven, my top seven moment. Um, it's the fight that Jamie and Claire have over the overseer on Jocasta's estate. So his name is Brian's, I think, B-R-B-Y-R-N-E-S. So Brins, Brian's, not sure. Um, so he is just a horrible man. Jocasta knows it, but hasn't been able to fire him because she doesn't think she can do it, I guess. Probably she can't. Um he gets into a physical altercation with one of the slaves that he's overseeing who goes after him. Um, Brian's hangs him up, kind of lynches him to be honest. It's horrible. Claire and Jamie go um, to try and help, try to calm down the situation. And um, you know, the, the man dies, the slave dies. Um, and Brian's lives, his ear was cut off, so he's missing an ear and he's kind of banged up. So at the time, Claire bandages the ear. She kind of explains she's a doctor. She has to help anyone who's hurt, no matter if she agrees with their ways or not. Um, of course she doesn't. And then a couple weeks later, she and Jamie are talking and he says, um, well, Brian's is dead and, um, you know, she says, well, what do you mean? Why didn't anyone tell me he was sick? So he had lockjaw, which I don't know anything about, but I guess it's a kind of a blood infection that um, can't be cured. So especially in this time, there would have been nothing she could have done for him except, you know, she kind of says, well, medically, there's nothing I could have done, but, you know, I'm a doctor. It would have been my duty to, to sit with him and give him as much comfort as, as I possibly could just with the presence of another person. And Jamie says, yeah, I know, but no. Um, so they had this big fight because Claire is kind of saying, you know, I took an oath when I became a doctor. You can't get in the way of that. Um, and Jamie says, well, first off, it would have been very dangerous for you to be there when he died. People might have thought you had something to do with it. She was there when the slave died. And so there might start to be questions raised. Um, and also it was justice that he suffered how he did. And Jamie kind of made that decision and stands by it. So I thought that that was a top seven moment for sure. 
I'm not necessarily sure whose side I'm on in that argument. Um, I usually take Claire's side because I'm not, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm not a Jamie, I'm more of a Claire. Um, but yeah, definitely a top 10 moment for sure. Um, again, reading a good book makes you stop and think and this one made me stop and think. I don't, I haven't decided, <laughs> I haven't decided which side I'm on. Um, okay, moment number eight, moment number eight, we get another taste of John Gray. Yes, uh, he's popped up again. So he and William, his foster son, and of course, Jamie's um, blood son, blood son, that sounds weird, Jamie's uh, natural son, uh, he's the biological father to William, although uh, it's a secret, arrive on Fraser's Ridge. And um, Claire meets William by the river. He has all these leeches on him. He's like trying to get them off. She recognizes him instantly. She says he, it's his eyes. He has the same eyes as Jamie. And just the way he like holds his body and carries his body. Um, that really resonated with me because that's happened a couple of times with my family. Like um, my brother, especially I have a younger brother. And sometimes I'll just see him just the way he stands or he'll just move a little bit and I see my parents instantly. It's it's scary. It's scary when that happens. Um, so yeah, so she describes that moment with William. Um, I loved their visit. Uh, really fun. Um, I think one of the interesting parts is how Jamie feels about their relationship. So um, for part of the part of the visit, Jamie has to take William away because John Gray is sick and it's contagious, it's smallpox. So he takes, that's um, the next moment, that's moment number nine is the smallpox. Um, so he takes William away, like camping for a few days to give John Gray time to recover and not be contagious. Um, and William does not want to go. Like Jamie has to threaten to like tie him to the horse. He doesn't want to go. And it comes out that his mother died or the his aunt, but the woman who acted as his mother from birth, um, died on the ship over. And now he's been told his father's really ill, so ill he can't even see him. And Jamie has kind of this jealousy of their relationship, um, you know? And then, then he feels a wash of gratitude that like, oh my gosh, how lucky for his son that even though, you know, his biological father can't really be a parent to him, that he has this relationship where he feels so close to the man who is raising him. So I just thought that was very interesting. It's a very complex dynamic between these three guys, right? Jamie and John, really good friends. John has a major thing for Jamie. Jamie will never reciprocate. And then there's William in the middle of it, right? And John Gray loves William for himself, you know, as his own person, but also because he's the son of Jamie, his best friend, and the guy he has a thing for. Like it's it's very complicated with these three men. So I really enjoyed hearing um, Jamie's perspective on it and how he kind of shows himself to be such a mature and good person where he does feel this bit of jealousy, but then he just goes back to this gratitude and you know how thankful he is that John is raising him so well, they have such a tight bond, and that John is willing and able to let Jamie have these glimpses into his son's life because if it was anyone else, Jamie would have nothing, like no information, no visits. Um, so yeah, really, really amazing. And of course, at this point, William has no idea. So I really liked that. Um, this part is also really funny. Uh, William falls into the outhouse and um, they have to pull him out and you see the hashtag Fraser temper come out. Um, he almost has a complete meltdown. Claire kind of stops it before it gets too out of hand, but hilarious, absolutely hilarious scene. So um, that was my top eight moment for sure was the visit from John Gray and William to the Ridge. Okay, top moment number nine is um, the smallpox. So John Gray, <clears throat> okay, so top moment number nine is smallpox. 
So John Gray and William arrive at Clan Jamie's um, and it's pretty quickly evident that um, John is sick. There's also a First Nations man in their corn crib who some of Ian's friends brought to Claire to see if she could heal him. Um, and he dies, um, unfortunately. And John Gray is really sick. Ian is really sick with smallpox. Um, so that's kind of the reason that Jamie and William need to go off on their own. So it's clearly a plot device to have the two of them spend some time together. And then it's also um, this, the, there's a family um, a little where, a little ways away um, where Claire just helped deliver a newborn to that family. And it comes out that a bunch of them had smallpox, a bunch of them died. And the patriarch of that family, Herr Mueller, Herr Mueller, Herr Mueller <laughs> um, thinks that it's a curse from the First Nations people that live close to him. He's a very, he's described as a very stubborn, intractable old man. Um, and he takes, you know, his, his sons and sons-in-law and attacks this village, um, killing many of them. They also have this sickness. So they're totally decimated. They're moving away. Um, I thought this was a, just a really, uh, key point to have because, um, Claire's friend is a victim of uh, Herr Mueller in this episode. Um, and she had kind of pre-warned Claire that this would happen at the end of a previous section. She said um, that, you know, that sickness comes, it's no one's fault and um, there's nothing you could have done. And Claire is very puzzled by this, but clearly this woman kind of had a vision of what was gonna happen and um, wants to make it clear she doesn't blame Claire because Herr Mueller, in a totally misguided event, he's, he's clearly gone insane with the loss of his family. Um, and then he targets other people, which is just totally horrific. But um, he brings Claire evidence of his crime and she is just totally horrified. And it's, it's really an upsetting part of the book. Um, so yeah, so smallpox is a big one. Smallpox was the thing that I learned about in history class. Like, I don't know, when I, when I was in history, that was a big part of like the lessons we were taught about um, First Nations people in Europeans meeting was this kind of exchanging of sicknesses and this smallpox blanket. Um, so it's interesting that she included an episode of that in the book. Maybe it wouldn't have been as authentic without it. Um, just to show how vulnerable all these populations were. Like these Lutheran Germans, very vulnerable. Half his family is wiped out. Um, John Gray is maybe only saved because Claire was there to nurse him through. Um, and this First Nations population also, their whole village, they move because it's just horrific with you know the sickness that they had. They couldn't cure it. None of their cures were working. Um, because it was smallpox, kind of a foreign, a foreign illness. And yeah, so that was top moment number nine. Makes a big impact on the story. Um, very sad to read though. Okay, top moment number 10. I'm going to kind of mix it up a little bit. This is maybe more of a funny take on um, all the books and Diana Gabaldon's writing. Um, we've got some missing storylines here, okay? We've got some things that... I have no idea what's going on with, and it's not because I missed reading it, it's because it's not there. Um, so Fergus and Marsley, where are they? What's going on with them? Um, what's the story here? Fergus kind of comes with them part way and then he goes back to Jamaica, but no one has any idea. Um, yeah, just, you know, kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, the other one is Ian's storyline, okay? Ian is there, but we don't really hear much from him other than him having to go in the outhouse because um, he dropped John Gray's pistol. So Jamie makes him go get it because he's mad that they were in there in the first place messing around. Um, and we just kind of hear, oh yeah, he just likes hanging out with the First Nations people. He's made friends with some of the young men from the village nearby and they all go hunting together. And that's it. 
That's all we hear about um, Ian. Like, there are two funny things that happen to him. And, oh yeah, he's just often gone. That's it. <laughs> um, also, the Brianna and Roger stuff. Tiny part of the book. Tiny part of the book so far. Um, so, no wonder I felt that they weren't connecting. Because we get, like, 20 pages with them out of 540. Um, also, after the trip away for um, William and Jamie, they come back and I guess Jamie or William and John Gray leave, but we don't see it. Um, nothing, we don't see the reunion, we don't see them leave, we have no idea what happened to them. They're just gone. <laughs> so um, I was reading some comments on some other things and uh, reading some things that Diana Galadon has said and she has said that she forgets about storylines. Um, that her mind just wanders to something else and she's really focused on that and she just kind of, it just doesn't go back to that other storyline. So anyway, I just found that really funny. That's my top 10 moment um, from this book is all the missing information. And it's so funny because this is a long book, okay? I call this book, again, I call it a door stopper because it's pretty thick. This book, now the pages are small and the writing's small or whatever, this book is 10,075 pages long. And we still don't have all the information. So I guess I can't blame her for not including it. Because how long would it be if she did it and wrap up every storyline and include a footnote about every character? I guess it would just be too long to read. Um, so I can't say that I blame her. But yeah, that is my top 10 moment from uh, Drums of Autumn. Right, well, those were my top 10 moments from Drums of Autumn, the amazing book in the Outlander series. I am really enjoying reading it. I'm about halfway through, um, and I will update you when I finish. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to the channel. I post a lot more Outlander stuff um, and just general life stuff is coming up on here. Thanks so much for your support, and I'll catch you in the next one.